Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome to the first video in the Siege of Vrax lore series. We will begin, of course, with the most anticipated video in the series, that on the Death Core of Krieg. Much has, of course, been made about these rather famous fighters and their dour attitude, their willingness to sacrifice, and, of course, the fact that their world is an absolute hellhole on a scale that is rare even within the Imperium of Man. But did you know that once Krieg was a veritable paradise world? It was rich from wide-spanning trade, export, and produce. And whilst it lacked the natural beauty of a true paradise world, being of course a hive world, it was prosperous. Its citizens were about as happy as any imperial citizen of a hive world had any right to be, and ruled by the Council of Autocrats, it was a flourishing society that would go on to flourish for hundreds of years. Until finally, the ruling class decided that since they were doing such a damn good job of governing Krieg, that they deserved a little extra. After all, every few years they had to offer up significant percentages of their total produce, their wealth and industrious resources to the wider Imperium. An Imperium that barely even knew that Krieg existed. After all, when was the last time that the wider Imperium did anything for Krieg, eh? When was the last time that it had done something for the Council? Why should the Council of Autarchs, the very reason why the planet was doing so well, have to suffer these deprivations at the hand of an Imperium that hardly even cares? And due to these extortionist ties, many of the planet's ruling elites had to languish in a mere two or three palaces. Surely they reasoned that if only Krieg's resources was left to Krieg alone, as was only right and proper, they could make everything so much better. Now, of course, the Council was well aware that some of the more narrow-minded people on the planet might view such ideas as downright treasonous, which was, of course, a blatantly ridiculous idea. It was, of course, the Imperium that had betrayed Krieg not the other way around. Nevertheless, for the time being at least, plans would have to be laid in secret, until Krieg was ready to redress this injustice placed upon it by the extortionist tactics of a tyrannical empire. And the Autar Council had been in charge for a very, very long time, so once they decided they were going to secede from this tyrannical empire, it didn't take long before their plans came to fruition. Having seized control of most of the governmental organizations of Krieg, along with the various governors of the Hive Cities and most of the planet's PDF and Imperial Guard regiments, it looked as if their coup had not only succeeded, they had succeeded beyond their wildest expectations. It began with the High Autarch declaring martial law, and once his forces were in position, utilizing the surprise and confusion that this declaration had garnered, they declared that they were seceding from the Imperium of Man. At this point, the Council's loyalists were already in control of the vast majority of Krieg's infrastructure and military. Loyalist forces had been placed around those Imperial Guard forces whose loyalties could not be guaranteed. There was resistance, but it was confused, unorganized, scattered, and in most cases already surrounded. One of the few exceptions to this rule was Colonel Yurton's 83rd Krieg Regiment, stationed in the high city of Ferrograd. Ferrograd's governor had been sympathetic towards the ideas of the council, but had not yet fully made up his mind. The council had let him run free because they were of the impression that he had, and that he was going to join them, something that in the end he probably would have, if it were not for the swift actions of Colonel Yurton, who moved to seize control of the Hive in a military coup. Ferrograd subsequently became the focus point for the remaining Imperial Loyalist forces on Krieg, 
of which there were depressingly few. Some had managed to break out from the traps laid for them, or otherwise avoid the notice of the traitor forces, but they were hilariously outnumbered, and Fedograd appeared to be literally the only hive on the entire planet that had managed to remain fully within Imperial hands. Now, of course, a Hive City is a formidable defensive work in and of itself, but completely alone, surrounded on all sides, is on a hostile planet, and having received word that Imperial reinforcements were not coming, the Colonel was left with a bit of a dilemma. There was simply no way that he could win this by himself. He could hold out possibly for years and maybe a decade if he was extraordinarily lucky. But without additional Imperial reinforcement from the wider Imperium, there simply was no realistic hope of victory, and said reinforcements were not coming. The Council of Autarchs were entirely aware of just how wide and massive the Imperium was. They were also entirely aware what the consequences of betrayal were. That is why the first objectives of their uprising were the orbital defense silos, protecting Krieg from enemy invasion. Krieg was a vital world within the Imperium, one of considerable importance, and thusly its defenses had also been prioritized quite highly. And in this particular instance, Krieg being a massive hive world, its planet-side defenses were already formidable in the extreme, every single hive city being home to billions of Imperial citizens, potentially millions of PDF troops, and gargantuan defensive works built into the cities themselves. If the enemy managed to reach the planet, the hives would be able to hold out for years. And even better, if the hives had access to massive anti-orbital defenses, any invasion force could be reduced significantly before they even set a single foot, boot, tentacle, or whatever else they might be walking on, on Krieg soil. Obviously, the planet was, at the moment, at least, embroiled in a civil war, which would weaken these defenses to some degree, but the Imperium simply could not spare the sheer number of troops and ships required for an invasion of Krieg. And that was assuming that Colonel Jürgen could remain defiant until the Imperial forces could be assembled and finally make the transit to Krieg. When in all due reality, whilst it was possible that the Colonel could hold out for an extended period of time, being surrounded, outnumbered, and considering the fact that the Council knew that it was very important to finish him off before any theoretical Imperial reinforcements, his defiance was, in all due likelihood, measured in months at least, and years at most. And whilst that might sound plenty, the Imperium is a vast place indeed. Not to mention, the invasion of a planet like Krieg would require substantial dedications of manpower. The recruitment of these troops, their training, their organization, and their eventual transportation to Krieg, not to mention the Imperial Navy elements required, could take years, if not decades, to find and organize. The simple fact was that the Autarch's schemes had succeeded beyond their wildest expectations. The Imperium had absolutely no idea this was coming, and as such, not even the most cursory preparation had been made in case of a Krieg uprising. This left Colonel Jürgen with very little indeed, except for his final orders before the traitors knocked out his antenna and therefore his communication with the wider Imperium. The order was for him to resist, with all means at his disposal to engage the enemy, to punish their treachery, and emerge victorious, whatever the costs. Along with this message was a single attachment, a string of binary code which once presented to Ferrograd's tech adept, revealed the location of a vast armory beneath Ferrograd, along with a second lengthy string of binary code. Launch codes. Finally, on the day of the Feast of the Emperor's Ascension, all the preparations were complete. Suddenly, the traitor forces of the Ortar Council found themselves assaulting undefended positions. They pushed further into the hive of Ferrograd 
and found nothing. Until finally, they arrived before the titanic blast doors leading into the hive proper. Sealed, shut, and welded. Before the secessionists could really start figuring out what this all meant, it was all made blindingly obvious to them. As the earth beneath their feet started to shake and massive pillars of flames reached skywards. Kilometers away, the operators of Auspex systems could only watch on helplessly as dozens and then dozens more until hundreds of Auspex contacts were rising up from the hive city of Feragrad. It turned out that the hive city of Feragrad had been chosen to store vast quantities of Dark Age of Technology weaponry of the nuclear kind and of a wide variety of flavors as well. Some of the weapons were designed to explode in the upper atmosphere, scattering nuclear radiation across the entire planet. Others were designed to land on major secessionist hive cities and take care of them in a somewhat more conventional fashion. The result was that first the planet was ravaged by hellish nuclear firestorms, and when those subsided, the planet was then covered in nuclear winter. And who doesn't love a good old-fashioned radioactive snowball? Now, of course, there is really only so much you can do to prepare yourself for a literal nuclear apocalypse, but the citizens of Ferrograd, those deemed necessary to the continued survival of the Imperial Loyalist population, and of course its defenders had done what they could to prepare themselves for the nuclear fallout they were about to unleash. The secessionists, however, well, they didn't even know the weapons were there. And as such, their preparations were... <laughs> less than entirely adequate. Now, of course, once again I must mention that Hive Cities are designed to survive pretty much anything, but... Only if they're given enough actual notice to prepare for said eventuality. A direct nuclear strike, well, while survivable, it was certainly going to strip off quite a bit of ablative protection, not to mention a few thousand hab blocks. In the same manner, Krieg's PDF and secessionist regiments were relatively well prepared, relatively well prepared in that they were fairly well equipped and nuclear eventuality were amongst the list of things they were potentially prepared to deal with, but with virtually no warning, well, again, the mere fact that they could have been prepared does very little for the fact that they were not prepared. Once the, in this case, literal firestorm had died down and the nuclear dust had begun to settle, the secessionists were not done for. They had not been destroyed as some had hoped, but it had certainly leveled the playing field. As it now stood, the loyalists possessed millions, possibly as much as a billion or two civilians, which could eventually, of course, be turned into yet more meat for the grinder, and an unnumbered quantity of Imperial Guard regiments, probably stretching into a couple million as well. The secessionists still held a considerable military advantage, but they now found themselves fighting in an irradiated wasteland. This meant that they would have to deal with actually surviving first and fighting a war second, whilst the surviving loyalists found themselves with no such impediments. After the Loyalists launched a major campaign of counterattack, the two sides eventually settled into a long and protracted stalemate. The situation in which both parties now found themselves, that of fighting amidst an irradiated hellhole of a landscape, meant that there weren't actually too many areas of the planet that could actually sustain extended combat. The population had long since retreated far below ground, and combat now took place either in large-scale underground engagements where both parties were digging tunnels against one another, or in limited above-ground engagements. This particular form of warfare turned out to be remarkably vicious, 
On the one hand, the trenches needed to be occupied at all times in case the enemy launched a surprise attack. However, the men that actually had to occupy those trenches could only do so for extremely limited periods of time before they were exposed to lethal doses of radiation. This meant that the men on the surface would have to constantly be cycled in and out to at the very least extend their lifespan. Don't get me wrong, once they were deployed on the surface, their life was a finite resource. Something that would come to greatly colour the nature of Krieg's warfare, but at the very least, the resources that was their lives could be spent as slowly and grudgingly as possible. A second side effect of this very limited operational time was that any offensive had to be planned to be absolutely gargantuan. Once large numbers of forces were dedicated to a surface conflict, they had to gain some ground. Every available man had to be thrown against the objective, in literal human wave style warfare, to assure that at least something was gained from the expenditure of their lives. But again, considering the fact that the vast majority of men committed to such an action, were essentially already dead men walking once their names were called, it meant that the war was a slow one indeed. The casualty numbers apocalyptic. It became all-out warfare, with every man, woman and child dedicated to nothing but the eventual end of the conflict, which would finally arrive 500 years after the ruling Council of Hortax turned their back upon the Imperium. And as for that very Imperium, they had turned their back on Krieg in return. It turns out that the Council of Ortax weren't entirely mistaken. Once Krieg was turned into a radioactive hellhole, the White Imperium simply had no use for them. It might sound cynical, it might sound monstrous indeed, but the simple fact was that the benefits of reclaiming Krieg were dwarfed by the costs of doing so. And as you can probably imagine, after 500 years, it came as quite a shock to the Imperium when they were contacted from Krieg, a planet that they had long since written off as a death world at absolute best, and in all due likelihood, simply just a dead planet. And whilst of course the saviour of Krieg, and amusingly enough, its destroyer, Colonel Jürgen, was long since dead, the people of Krieg had inherited his goal of one day returning to the Imperium of Man, and so here they were, but they had nothing to offer the Imperium. Their world was still a nuclear hellhole and would remain so for quite some time yet. This was not the thriving merchantile hub of years gone past. This was little more than a radioactive ball hurling through space. What could such a world possibly have to offer the Imperium in return for the Imperium's protection and potentially some help in well, fixing that hellhole of a planet? There was nothing, or wait, there might be something. Krieg had been at war for 500 years. The society that breeds was, unsurprisingly, rather militaristic. And that military had been at war for 500 years in some of the most hellish conditions imaginable. And the Imperium does always need soldiers. The Adeptus Administratum levied upon Krieg the highest manpower tithe possible. And so, officially, the Death Corps of Krieg was born, although unofficially they'd called themselves that already for quite a while during their lengthy civil war. But the Administratum is not completely without heart, just mostly, and so they decided that at the very least they should let Krieg start out a little slow. Their society was in ruins, well, hell, even that would be considered a very charitable interpretation of Krieg's current situation, and so they wanted to give them a little bit of time to gather themselves up, to start rebuilding a little bit. And so for starters, the Adeptus Administratum requested that the Departamento Monitorum request a single regiment of Imperial Guard to be raised. The officials on Krieg responded by stating that they had already raised 
trained, organized, and equipped 20 regiments for immediate deployments. It was also added in a side note that every single one of the commanders of these 20 regiments are requested to be posted in the most hazardous battle zones that the Departmento Minitorum could find for them. Now, I consider myself a man of a considerable vocabulary. I flatter myself by supposing that I have a modicum of talent when it comes to painting pictures with words, but even I fall well and truly short of the necessary verbiage required to even begin to describe the sheer size, lust, and longing of the Adeptus Administratum's boner upon receiving this reply. But before one allows the vagaries of Winky Hood to lead one astray, these new regiments had to be tested. It was, of course, entirely possible that the men of Krieg could talk the talk, but could they walk the irradiated walk? It turns out that they could, beyond the wildest expectations, in fact, of the Departmento Minitorum. It turned out that 500 years of warfare had not only bred extraordinarily tough troops with a disregard for personal danger and death that bordered upon the insane, they had also developed an absolutely gargantuan armaments industry deep beneath the ground of their irradiated planet. Krieg was a package deal. Not only could it train and organize extraordinarily tough formations of fighting men, they could arm them as well. Upon hearing this, the Departmento Minitorium immediately requested that the Adeptus Administratum increase the tides leveled upon Krieg and turn it into a perfect war world. Additionally, they also lobbied for the introduction of so-called Vita Womb Birthing Technology to be granted to the officials on Krieg. And this was a very, very big thing indeed. The technology of Vita Wombs is... controversial, shall we say. In an Imperium that values the flesh, the humanity of its subjects more than anything, and in fact that views any form of artificial intelligence to be naturally inclined to wipe out any form of life, having people born entirely from artificial wombs, well, that's... that smacks of... well, tech heresy, honestly. But clearly, the Death Corps soldiers have not suffered any ill effect whatsoever. They remain amongst the most loyal, dedicated, and bloody-minded stubborn of all of the Imperium servants. In fact, when they became available in larger numbers to Imperial commanders, many stalemates that had lasted for decades were broken. Scenarios that would either require the mass expenditure of penal legion troops or the deployment of elite formations like the Adeptus Astartes or the Tempestus Stormtroopers were now broken, using nothing but blood, grit, and the sheer determination of the core. The writing on the wall was clear indeed. Krieg's future had been decided. Eventually, Krieg was turned into an official Departmento Munitorum war world. This enforced the highest possible level of humanitarian ties upon the planet and also gave it access to the Departmento Munitorum's vast resources. Material started flowing into Krieg at an unprecedented rate and its output of men and material skyrocketed. To the point that these days, Krieg does not raise Imperial Guard regiments. Krieg raises armies. Now, of course, it wasn't entirely perfect. Pretty, pretty goddamn close as far as the Munitorum was concerned, but they needed to add in one minor change. That being the Commissariat. Now, granted, the Krieg death cause had never failed, not once, and their planet, despite being subjected to some of the harshest regulation in the Imperium, never batted so much as an eyelash at it. Yet, the Department of Minotaurum almost felt like this was just a little bit too good to be true. Undoubtedly, many a commissar assigned to the death corps figured to themselves that they... <laughs> God, really? Really unlucky. Usually, a commissar is required to encourage the formations they're attached to to go beyond their duties to sacrifice in the name of the Emperor. A Death Corps of Krieg commissar needs to instead try and keep them from sacrificing themselves unnecessarily. 
this rather unusual situation means that in the Death Corps, commissars are less political officers and more tactical advisers, trying to rein in the worst excesses of their attached regiments. Death Corps commissars also tend to have a remarkably high rate of casualties. It turns out that if you put somebody whose primary duty is to inspire loyalty and zeal in people, and then getting massively out-zealed by the regular guardsmen they're supposed to be inspiring, that tends to give the commissars a bit of an inferiority complex, leading them to commit greater and even more insane deeds of self-sacrifice and zeal than even the average Krieg's guardsmen in order to try and set some kind of example to them. Another vital role of a commissar entrenched with a Death Corps regiment is diplomacy. Whilst, generally speaking, there is always a certain degree of friction expected whenever you place two Imperial Guard regiments from different worlds beside one another, the Death Corps is particularly antagonistic, shall we say. There are very few things about them that don't seem specifically designed to piss off regular people. One, they barely ever take their gas masks off, as they are trained to consider them a second skin. Wearing them at all times isn't technically required, but <laughs> it is encouraged. Secondly, they are all raised from birth to believe in the cult of sacrifice. Essentially, this is the idea that nothing they could sacrifice for the Emperor could ever possibly be too much, or hell, even enough, really. You can imagine just how dour a bunch of people the Death Corps are, considering that they have been bombarded with this since their very birth and considering they've also survived training, in which the casualty rate, even for Krieg and natives, is considered a bit appalling. Yeah, they're not exactly the life of the party, to put it mildly. To just add the final little cherry on top, they also nurture a strong disdain to anyone that isn't them. They view basically 96% of the rest of the galaxy as soft weaklings, and, well, in comparison, they certainly do have a point. Basically, if you are not the most rabid form of Emperor Botherer, they will consider you to not be anywhere near pious enough, and they will tell you so. To your face. Loudly. And repeatedly. This means that wherever possible, Death Corps regiments should be deployed alongside other Death Corps regiments, which, fortuitously, considering the sheer volume of regiments Krieg produces, is quite often entirely possible. Or, alternatively, they should be placed alongside some other band of religious fanatics. They get along famously well with Maccabian Janissaries, for example, or other regiments who are overly fond of strict discipline, like, for example, the Mordian Iron Guard. And now that we've just touched upon the Cult of Sacrifice a little bit, it's time to talk about it, the Cult of Sacrifice, and the training for the Death Corps. Firstly, what is the Cult of Sacrifice? Well, it is the idea, as mentioned, that no sacrifice is too great. This is hammered into every single child on Krieg from the very moment they are born. They are told that the great sacrifice made by their forefathers during the nuclear cleansing of their world initiated by Colonel Jürgen was the first great sacrifice that they had to commit to make up for the atrocities committed by the ruling Council of Autarchs, who have been turned into some kind of combination of Satan, Beelzebub, Lucifer, and Hitler. And yes, I know several of those are basically the same thing, but I'm just trying to illustrate just how thick they smeared it on when it comes to the Council of Autarchs. They are literally the worst thing to have ever happened, ever. In fact, your average Krieg's Guardsman, if asked, would probably have to vex lyrically about whether or not Horus was really quite as bad as the High Council. And since Krieg was the planet who birthed such an absolute atrocity, there is quite simply no limit to the amount of sacrifice that Krieg should be expected to provide in the Emperor's service. And mind you, this is not strictly limited to martial sacrifice. It also involves the quote-unquote civilian population, although there isn't really anyone who could be considered a civilian on Krieg, or at the very least, not in the way that we would normally use the word. 
You see, the entirety of Krieg society is focused around nothing else but churning out as many guardsmen, as many guns, as many artillery pieces, as many tanks as it is possible. This means that essentially the entire population is engaged in warfare in one way or the other. All of the fit menfolk, and indeed even the non-fit ones, are pretty much universally recruited into the Death Corps of Krieg. Now, of course, there are always the occasional exceptions here and there, but they are few and far between. Meanwhile, the female part of the population along with the children, mind you, are pretty much all working in the factories. As you can probably imagine, there's not much of a childhood period at all on Krieg. You're working in the factories in one way or another pretty much as soon as you're able to walk on your own. For the male part of the population, this is a brief period of relative safety. Relative as in there's only so safe you can ever get whilst living on a highly industrialized subterranean hive world where the entirety of the rest of the planet, e.g. anything above ground, is laced with lethal radiation. This, by the way, is pretty much also the only chance they have of escaping a fate in the Death Corps of Krieg. Mind you, most of them don't want to. They have been raised on the ideas of a heroic sacrifice since they were old enough to understand words. Most of them consider the idea of finally being recruited into the Death Corps as an honor, something that they look forward to, something to celebrate when it happens, but... If they manage to develop some form of talent or they prove themselves particularly valuable, let's for example say that you've got a full-on mechanical genius. He has increased the productivity of his workstation by several hundred percent. He is just incredible at his job. In that case, his overlord might decide that it would be better for the wider war effort for him to remain on Krieg, but these are very, very much so the exceptions rather than the rule. And then, of course, comes the actual training for the Death Corps. If you've been paying even the slightest amount of attention, you will probably have gathered by now that Krieg is not exactly a nice place to grow up. You wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning, you've got maybe half an hour to chow down some absolutely terrible breakfast, probably consisting of some form of regurgitated, reconstituted and recycled waste material, after which, it's off to work, which almost invariably takes place in some form of massive industrialized factory complex that never ceases operation. You've got a 12-hour shift, and some sad-ass motherfucker has the 12-hour shift after you. Unless you are fortunate enough to be some form of administratum or departmento munitorum clerk, your job is likely to be noisy, filthy, dangerous, and exhausting. Furthermore, you are fed just enough to maintain maximum productivity and make sure that you don't die, at the very least, not from starvation. And if you are lucky enough to actually receive wages, it's not going to be a whole lot, to put it like that. And even if you did get a lot of money, what the hell is there to spend it on? You are on Krieg. Luxury goods is not exactly at the top of the priority list for the Departmento Munitorum. And yet, all of that is going to appear as if nothing more than a pleasant, fluffy dream once you're finally enrolled into the Death Corps of Krieg. Those of you who have been in the army have probably had the pleasure of getting intimately acquainted with a drill sergeant or two. Now, of course, drill sergeants are a part of any functional army, and they tend to be extraordinarily verbose and vicious creatures. Quick to anger and slow to forget, they are the intransigent elephants of any armed forces. Furthermore, they primarily sustain themselves by feeding off the suffering of others. Therefore, it is most fortunate for them that their chosen profession provide them with such an ample supply of fresh-faced recruit to torture. Incidentally, their chosen form of sustenance is also the reason why they seem to always be awake before anybody else. As you can probably imagine, after going several hours without bullying some poor white shield, their monstrous little bellies must be absolutely famished. The point is that the drill sergeant truly is one of God's more heinous creatures, but there is also a soft, quivering pinkness to them. At the end of the day, despite their fondness for pain and suffering, their job is to break you down so they can build you up better, and some of the fluffiest men I've ever known wear their stripes with pride. The Death Corps also has drill sergeants, but there is one pertinent difference. 
They have no interest in tearing you down to build you back up. They are of the opinion that if you can be torn down in the first place, then you are simply not deathcore material. And the best thing they can do both for you and the core is to break you as quickly as possible, either fatally or by sending your in all due likelihood crippled ass back to the factory lines. Deathcore training, unsurprisingly, is a bit on the brutal side. It is not necessarily that different from the training doctrines in and of themselves of other regiments. However, the key difference lies in the implementation. Other regiments have mock battles. The Corps has them, but they use live artillery. Other regiments may train in bayonet combat. The Corps also does this, with unsheathed and fully sharpened bayonets. Other regiments may train men to stay down by firing a machine gun over their heads as they crawl along a trench. The Corps does this as well. It simply dispenses with the pretense and orders the MG crew to try their damnedest to hit anyone stupid enough to be spotted. The devil, as they say, is in the details, or in this case, I suppose it's probably more like the Grim Reaper. And let's pause for a moment on the idea of mutilation on Krieg. Yes, I know, a somewhat morbid pause, but I wish to try and emphasize just how much of a shithole this really is, because the simple fact that you're basically a slave, chained forever to a massive churning war machine that cares diddly dick for your well-being, that alone is not quite enough. Imagine being one of the menfolk on Krieg. Imagine entering into the death court and getting hurt. Imagine standing in the wrong position when an artillery shell falls out of the sky and losing half of your leg, for example. In our modern society, there is a vast network of support organizations specifically designed to try and allow you to continue living your life with as little inconvenience as possible considering your injury. On Krieg, not only does that not exist, but think about this. If the entirety of society has been raised on the idea that sacrifices everything. Indeed, the only value your life has is the amount of sacrifice you are capable of personally making in the name of the Imperium. How do you think they might treat somebody who, technically speaking, failed to make the maximum sacrifice by becoming a member of the Death Corps of Krieg and dying for the Emperor? And not only that, he gets sent back into the rest of society as a cripple. He is going to require special resources. He is going to require medical time. He is going to require certain aids, crutches, wheelchairs, these kinds of things. And he is probably going to be less effective at producing stuff in the factories than a hale and hearty man, obviously enough. How do you think such a society might treat someone like that? I'd reckon not particularly fucking good. If you're going to get into an accident while training for the Death Corps, it better be a fatal one, because the old saying holds true, especially on Krieg. No matter how shit your training is, no matter how arse your life has been up until this point, it can always get worse. But hope isn't entirely lost for the poor bastard who inevitably gets enrolled within the Death Corps, because there are a few ways he could actually, possibly, potentially, maybe, although extremely unlikely, better his lot. Not that your average Death Corps Guardsman would actually give a shit about that, but still, for the sake of argument. There are several positions within the Death Corps that are, if not particularly cushier, at the very least slightly safer than the others. Krieg does not have much of an aristocracy, or, well, at least not anymore. The most in the way of an aristocracy they might have are the various supervisors and bosses that run the factories, and those really aren't much of an aristocracy at all. And that, of course, means that the officers of the Death Corps are invariably drawn from the Death Corps itself. Generally speaking, they are veterans from other regiments already formed that, through a mixture of luck, skill, perseverance, and perhaps a little bit of the Emperor's favor, have somehow managed to actually survive in the Death Corps for an extended period of time. Now, you might think that mere survival itself isn't really enough of a qualification for officers' training, but, well, this is the fucking Death Corps. They really don't have a whole lot of other qualifications to go by, frankly. 
And considering the relative simplicity of the Death Corps' favorite tactic, e.g.e. line up vast quantities of men and then walk them slowly towards machine gun positions, you don't exactly require a Lord Solar level tactical genius to implement them, at the very least with a decent degree of precision. Though to be fair, this is actually a bit of an acquired skill. If you were to put, for example, a Cadian officer in charge of a Death Corps formation, he probably would lose all respect amongst his men the moment that he didn't suggest the most ridiculous, suicidal, self-sacrificing tactics possible. And if he were so silly as to suggest that maybe he should direct the battle from a bunker somewhere behind the lines, well, in all due likelihood, his soldiers would simply just wander off and do whatever they felt best, as clearly that officer was utterly insane. And of course, the reverse scenario also holds true. There has been experiments where Death Corps officers have been put in charge of non-Death Corps formations. The idea was that since these officers clearly have a certain knack for completing the most complicated of battlefield objectives, you know, that might have more to do with the forces they are commanding rather than their tactical flair, but hey details, they should be put in charge of other regiments. The problem is, of course, that the men of Krieg are a very, very special breed indeed, and even Maccabi and Jenny series will probably flinch at the idea of simply walking slowly across an open field towards pillboxes. It really does require a certain mindset, and that mindset is not found in many places outside of Krieg. As such, a Death Corps officer in charge of any non-Death Corps regiment is likely to find himself sacrificing for the Emperor in a highly accidental manner probably by falling on his bayonet several times, or accidentally discharging his last pistol into the back of his skull. You know, that kind of stuff. But even then, despite the fact that Death Court officers tend to have basically as Spartan, if not even more so of a lifestyle than the average Krieg Guardsman, because after all, he needs to set an example, at the very least he has slightly higher odds of living than the rest of the Guardsmen, since even the most self-sacrificing Krieg officer understands that he is far more useful in directing his men rather than wandering out in front of them and getting shot first. Now, granted, they still do prefer directing their men from a couple dozen meters behind the front line rather than three and a half kilometers, so, you know, safe is a relative term, yes, but it is safer, and as an officer, you get access to some of the perks of being an officer in the Death Corps of Krieg. These perks are, you get your personal little posse of a command squad, you have a dude to carry your Vox for you, you get a fancy-ass helmet with a golden bird on it, and you get a kick-ass greatcoat. If that isn't a step up, I just don't know what is. But, of course, there is a teeny weensy tiny little problem, namely that to actually become a Death Corps officer, you will have to survive the Death Corps for a very, very long time before that point, which, well, let's face it, that could be rather complicated. But there are several other specializations within the Death Corps that might possibly give you a halfway decent chance of not getting brutally mended and murdered, at the very least in your first engagements. One of these would be the Death Corps Grenadiers. Now, yes, this does mean that you would be entering into the specialized assault formations of the Death Corps, which, yes, that is going to be just about as dangerous as you think it will, but you will have access to some additional armor, bigger guns, and tons and tons of grenades. So, at the very least, you'll be equipped to survive, if nothing else. Oh, and by the way, you're going to have to be fucking massive to get into them. The Death Corps Grenadiers are kind of inspired by the Potsdam Giants, which is a formation from our own military history, where a particularly faggoty little Prussian prince decided that his special guards unit should be made up of nothing but massive strapping menfolk who looked adorable in uniform. Because why not? In the case of the Death Corps Grenadiers, however, they are not selected purely to be the fetish objects of some tiny little Prussian. Instead, they are selected for their size, their experience, and their aggressive spirit to form an elite formation of shock troopers. They are expected to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anything the 41st Millennium can throw at them, and considering the sheer amount and hideousness of shit that 40k can throw at your average cardsman, they could probably use the advantage of being above average build. But of course, merely just being a big boy isn't enough to stop a charging orc knob from snipping you in two with a power claw. 
As such, they are also equipped with a bit of specialized equipment. They will be issued with far more grenades, both frag and crack, than your average guardsman. They also have the privilege of being equipped with carapace armor. This should give them a decent chance of taking on at least one or two hits from most enemy infantry weapons, and even a potential chance of surviving a hit from something big, brutal, and nasty like, for example, a bolter. Not a particularly great chance, but a chance nonetheless. And of course, the best way of making sure that you will survive an enemy aiming a weapon at you is to shoot them in the face before they get to shoot you. To ensure that the Death Corps Grenadiers have enough oomph to put down even the nastiest creatures that might point a weapon at them, they are equipped with the Type 14 Lasgun H. This is the heavy, overcharged version of the standard Lasgun. The 14H, also known as a Hell Gun, is capable of putting out roughly 40 to 50% more energy per shot than the standard LAS Gun. As such, it requires a considerably larger energy source, and this is worn as a backpack on the Grenadier's back. The total output of this larger power pack is round about 200 shots, depending on the power setting and, of course, the weapon's condition, and that is one of the really, really big things. Its condition. You see, whilst the Hell Gun is a considerably more potent weapon than the Laz Gun, for example, whilst the standard issue Imperial Flashlight might in most cases tickle an orc, and you're going to need half a squad's worth of them to really put the bastard down, a Hell Gun blast to the face is going to put most greenskins down rather hard and quickly. This increased killing power, however, comes at a severe cost, both to the total capacity of the weapon, a mere 200 rounds, which is not fantastic at all, considering the sheer size and weight of the contraption, in addition to, of course, the fact that the Grenadiers are usually used as shock troopers. That means close-in, personal, and brutal fighting. They might also be required to hold the objectives they just recently captured for extended periods of time while the rest of the Corps batter their bloody little asses to them. Thusly, having a relatively mere 200 rounds at one's disposal is not ideal. Of course, steps are usually taken to remedy this. Whilst the sheer size and bulky nature of the pack means that it would be highly impractical to have one man carry two of them, Grenadier formations could, however, and should, wherever possible, be supported by Chimera armored transports, not only to ensure that the Grenadiers actually make it to their target, but also so that the Grenadiers can shove the little Chimeras as full of additional power packs as humanly possible. Another drawback, however, that is considerably more difficult to get around is the fact that the Hellgun is an extraordinarily temperamental little lady, and if you do not take the absolute best care of her, she's going to act up at the absolute worst possible timing. The Hellgun requires extensive, lengthy, and complicated maintenance, and it requires it often. Otherwise, the power of each individual last blast will start to decrease, the rate of fire will start falling off, and the weapon itself will start developing some rather unfortunate and wonky side effects. Let's just say that if you're carrying around a weapon capable of stopping an orc in its tracks, then you probably don't want it overheating too badly now, do you? And one final little problem. The Hellgun is moody at the best of days. This means that using it as a close combat weapon, as you can do with the humble lasgun by bashing someone over the head with the butt end, or using it with a bayonet, is simply not an option. If you whack somebody over the head with a hell gun, well, you'd best be prepared for a somewhat um, explosive finale, let's just say. It's not guaranteed that it'll blow up, but the odds are not on your side. Additionally, the Hellgun does not come with a bayonet lug, and considering, again, that these are stormtroopers expected to get up close and personal with the enemy, that is a pretty major problem once again. And no, unfortunately, you can't just scratch build one and attach it, because the problem isn't the design of the barrel. The problem is that the las bolts fired from the weapon are so hot that it will literally start melting the bayonet. The Hellgun, the poor thing, has a lot of drawbacks, but 
The men of Krieg follow regulations, and regulation says that grenadiers are supposed to carry hell guns. At least it is some small comfort that grenadier formations also use a high percentage of specialized weapons. Flamers, shotguns, plasma guns, melt guns, that kind of stuff. Although, I'm not entirely sure whether I would prefer to carry a hell gun or a plasma gun since both of the weapons have an uncomfortably high percentage chance of murdering their users. It is a very, very small wonder indeed that casualty rates amongst the Grenadiers are particularly high, even amongst the Death Corps of Krieg. This is also the reason why they're given the special cool-looking helmets with the skull-faced mask on them, because the men wearing these helmets are as good as dead. On average, 8 out of every 10 Grenadiers will end up in a very small box if he's lucky, or smeared across the landscape as so much pizza topping if he isn't. But hey, at least he had the honor of being selected by his Watchmaster or Commissar to join the Grenadiers, the elite of the Death Corps of Krieg. And it really is considered a privilege and an honor. Granted, they don't have the right to refuse the honor either, but an honor still is an honor. And as for privilege, well, it doesn't have much in the way of privileges. It is not a promotion, you retain the same rank as you did in the regular Death Corps, but... Well, you get a fancy helmet, which is gonna end up getting you killed, granted, but hey, details, and if you should be so incredibly fucking lucky as to actually survive, that makes you eligible for Watchmaster training. And Watchmaster is the first official rank one must achieve on the long and extraordinarily thorny road towards that fancy-ass officer's helmet, and is de facto a non-commissioned officer, the rough equivalent of a sergeant in other Imperial Guard regiments. As you probably gathered by now, when a Death Corps regiment is raised, all of its officers, including its NCOs, are brought in from other formations that have, in all due likelihood, been wiped the fuck out. Or, if by some utter goddamn miracle, have actually had too many officers, which considering the casualty rates, is pretty rare. Nevertheless, any Death Corps formation would not be complete without its NCOs, as these are the men responsible both for training the raw recruits and instilling in them the proper sense of responsibility that the battlefield requires. After all, they've had it easy up until now. The Watchmasters also double as squad leaders. In your average Death Court of Krieg regiments, you would have 82 Watchmasters, one for each individual infantry and or heavy weapon squad, one per platoon command squad, one veteran Watchmaster per company command squad, and finally, the role of Watchmaster for the regimental commander is taken by the regiment's commissar. Furthermore, each Watchmaster has himself a personal little butt boy, a teacher's pet if you wish. This is his senior guardsman aide. This is essentially the second in command, whether it be in the squad, in the platoon, or in the company command squad. He is also a person that the Watchmaster is essentially grooming for the role of Watchmaster. Not to listen, he still has to survive his period in the Grenadiers, but considering he's been under the personal tutelage of a Watchmaster, somebody who already made it through their Grenadier service, his chances of surviving are probably 3 in 10, rather than 2 in 10. Now, presuming that our hopeful little cadet has not only survived his grenadier service, but also made it through his period as a watchmaster, he will reach the first commissioned officer rank of the Death Corps of Krieg, which interestingly enough is not a direct command position at all, or well, it is, kind of, but not in the way you might expect. The Quartermaster is an interesting amalgamation of Battlefield Medic, Administratum Clerk, and Ecclesiarchy Preacher. He is supposed to wander the battlefield during and after a battle and retrieve casualties. Although, well, to be fair, retrieving casualties is his secondary duty. His primary duty, as hinted at by the name Quartermaster, is to get their equipment back. After all, replacement personnel are a dime a dozen, 
Krieg spits those out by the millions every single year, but las guns, power packs, bayonets, chainsaws, rebreathers, boots, uniforms... These things can be damn hard to get a hold of, especially since all of those millions coming out of Krieg also require all of these things before they leave the planet. Now, of course, the Quartermaster isn't entirely heartless. He will aid soldiers that are wounded. With certain qualifications, shall we say. The role has its origin during the brutal civil war, when resources were extraordinarily scarce, and in fact the most expendable resource for both sides was manpower. This meant that neither of the warring sides really wasted much in the way of resources on men that wouldn't fight again, and it was the Quartermaster's task to determine who deserved medical attention, because they could be returned to the fight within a relatively reasonable time frame, and who had earned the Emperor's mercy, which is of course a term used to describe a battlefield execution. These days, the Quartermasters are a little bit more merciful. Not in that way, I mean as in actually saving them, because they have access to considerably larger resources and considerably more technology with which to return troops to the front line. But even then, it is the Quartermaster's job to put the needs of the regiment ahead of those of any single individual wounded soldier. This means that if the Quartermaster deems that the same amount of resources that would be spent on one severely wounded man could potentially save two others, he will not hesitate a single instant to put a las ball through the first man's head, pausing just long enough to deliver him the Emperor's benediction to make sure that his soul flies straight and true to the Emperor's side. Which, to be fair, it might. The Emperor is at this point pretty much a Chaos God. It's not entirely impossible that he's got himself a little part of the warp somewhere where these poor pitiful souls can rest. The alternative, well, let's not dwell too much on that, shall we? It'll make an already rather depressing episode even worse. And as for the command aspect, as mentioned, the Quartermaster is a commissioned officer, which means that he is officially commissioned to lead men into battle, unlike the Watchmaster who is a non-commissioned officer. However, the Quartermaster, as mentioned, do not lead soldiers. Instead, they usually surround themselves with a gaggle of medical personnel and servitors since of course Quartermasters are few and far between, and after a nice big battle of marching slowly into machine gun fire, there is more than enough for a Quartermaster to do, so much that he needs to delegate at least a little bit. Assuming that the person in question survives the Quartermaster role as well, which by the way is probably the safest of the ones so far, then he will finally become a proper officer with a proper command and everything, and the usual rank structure will now reassert itself. There are of course another couple specialized roles within the Death Corps however, beyond the usual guardsmen, these being a Death Corps Engineer and a Death Corps Rider. The Riders are not so much a specialized branch as they are a pseudo-elite within the Death Corps. They are cavalry that specialize in direct assault. Yep, that's right, whilst most cavalry in 40k perform a harassing role, essentially meaning that they're motorized infantry without the motor part, that they will descend from their horses and fight on foot, the Death Riders, they utilize their hunting lances in the way they were always meant to do, in straight up massed cavalry charges. Now, this would be suicidal for pretty much any Rough Rider regiment, but the Death Riders are equipped with the Krieg Steeds. This is a very, very heavily genetically modified version of the original Terran horse, although at this point it's probably got more in common with a fucking grizzly bear than it does a horse. These things have been known to take several heavy bolter rounds to the chest, essentially pulping virtually all of its internal organs and still keep going for another couple hundred meters. Despite all of this, the casualty rates amongst the Death Riders are actually relatively small when compared to the infantry. Of course, when they are actually in direct combat, they die like absolute fucking flies, at a rate that even the infantry would shake their heads at, but for the most part, they are deployed as light screening troops, 
as scouts and as a rapid breakthrough force. They are not, generally speaking, hurled against entrenchment and bunker complexes. Due to this somewhat unusual nature, the members of the Death Riders are usually selected for two traits that in the infantry would be considered highly unfitting indeed, and that is independent thought and initiative. Both of which are considered dirty, filthy curse words in the infantry, but due to their role as advanced scouts, breakthrough troops, and screening troops, the Death Riders have to be able to make independent decisions without waiting for their higher commanders to give them instructions. But this self-reliance is not entirely unique within the Death Corps, although relatively rare. There is one further branch of the Death Corps military that also needs to have the ability to make decisions on the fly, and that is the second and last specialization, Death Corps Engineers. If the officers are the brain, the Death Corps riders its eyes and ears, and the infantry its lifeblood, then the Death Corps engineers are the strong hands of the army. They are the ones that dig the fortifications. They are the ones that prepare the positions for artillery. They are the ones that dig the offensive saps, allowing the infantry to get closer to the enemy's position without having to wander unprotected through no man's land. And all of that is of course before we get to their true main military purpose, that of digging massive fucking tunnels underneath the enemy's lines. Either for offensive purposes, e.g. burrowing into the enemy's trenches and then unloading thousands upon thousands of guardsmen, or by depositing vast quantities of explosives and making sure that the enemy lines simply cease to exist. Unfortunately, the enemy is very rarely particularly fond of this eventuality, and will do everything in their power to stop the engineers from completing their mission. This leads to a peculiar and extraordinarily nasty form of warfare, partially because the two sides are essentially blind. Even the most high-tech 41st millennium technology can only do so much to identify an enemy that is sitting behind literal tons and tons and tons of earth. This means that every single swing of a pickaxe, every single move of a shovel, could potentially collapse in on an enemy mine, which leads to a very quick, very vicious, brutal close quarters encounter, where the two sides will be fighting each other in a literal trench, perhaps a couple meters wide and a couple meters tall at most, and frequently considerably less than that. And once an enemy mine has been broken into, all bets are off. The Death Corps engineers are given a huge quantity of specialized equipment to fulfill their variety of roles. Bolt cutters, auspexes, shotguns, long saw blade bayonets, folding spades, melter charges, mole launchers, frag grenades, crack grenades, carapace armor, specialized gas mask, etc, etc, etc. But perhaps one of their nastiest weapon are their gas hand grenades. These pump out a particularly vicious form of gas that is capable of even eating through gas masks if they are exposed to the gas for long enough periods of time. Now of course the Death Corps engineers are fully aware of this and yet they will not hesitate a single second in deploying these weapons. Any and all actions taken underground are bound to be short, vicious, and extraordinarily bloody for all parts involved. And perhaps the worst thing is that it is far easier to collapse a mine than it is to build it, which means that when a mine is discovered, the enemy is sitting on all the cards as to how to deal with it. And even if the Death Corps engineers are capable of breaking into the enemy mine quickly enough and decisively enough to stop them from collapsing it, you can bet your happy little ass that they will definitely be collapsing the exit. This can, in most cases, lead to the Death Corps engineers losing days, weeks, possibly even months or years worth of work in mere minutes. It can be an extraordinarily trying form of warfare. Not only are you under constant stress due to the fact that at any moment all hell can break loose, you also have to deal with the fact that rather frequently all of your hard work is going to be for absolutely nothing. It's the kind of warfare that is quite likely to break a man, but fortunately, the men of Krieg have seen worse, and will continue to see worse for as long as they are serving within the Death Corps. If anything, this really is the form of warfare that suits their demeanor the absolute best.
And finally, of course, we come to the humble Krieg Guardsman. There's nothing particularly special about him, except for the fact that he is probably the toughest fighting man in the entire galaxy. Of course, except for the post-human variant. He's also equipped in a rather fascinating way. On one hand, he has a very high-tech and very powerful respirator unit, along with a fully chemically and biologically sealed uniform. Their boots, their gloves, their greatcoats, their helmets, their respirators, absolutely everything is worked with special chemicals and the Guardsmen are constantly resupplied with fresh pots of this chemical to rub into their clothing, making sure that it remains proof against practically anything and everything the enemy can throw at them. Once fully dressed up, a Death Corps Guardsman is essentially invulnerable to any and all forms of bacteriological or gas-based warfare, with a few exceptions, the Life Eater virus of course being one of them. This near total immunity allows the Death Corps to deliver large scale gas attacks at the enemy while still allowing their infantry to advance practically unscathed. And whilst this would be an extremely traumatizing and claustrophobic form of warfare for pretty much anybody, just imagine wandering through a battlefield. Bullets are whizzing all around you, your helmet is deafening the sound, your gas mask worked in with all kinds of chemicals stinks to high heaven, and your sweat causes it to stick to your face in a very uncomfortable manner. You can barely see anything, and what you can see is constant boiling clouds of gas, and you are painfully aware that a single rift in your uniform will leave you dangerously exposed to said gas. This is the kind of situation that a lot of people would probably start panicking, but for a Death Corps Guardsman, this is normal. They are after all trained to wear their gas masks at pretty much any and all times during the day. Every single one of them has undergone dozens if not hundreds of hours in training in artificial gas chambers, and in all due likelihood, considering the severity of Krieg training, they've probably been bombarded by gas weapons on more than one occasion whilst training, quote unquote. For them, attacking during a heavy artillery and gas barrage would be absolutely nothing out of the ordinary. But for all of the advanced nature of their uniforms, they do carry a surprisingly archaic primary weapon. Their main weapon is the Lucius Pattern number 98 Lasgun. This is a variant on the standard issue Lasgun primarily produced on Krieg. And it has a fair few little quirks that makes it quite different from the standard issue Lasgun. The most noteworthy and obvious is probably the fact that it is a single shot weapon only. It has no other firing modes, no overcharge mode, no burst fire, and no automatic fire. Every time you pull the trigger, the weapon is going to do the exact same thing one time and one time only. In return, however, the weapon is considerably more powerful than your standard issue lasgun, around about 12 to 15 percent more oomph per lasbolt. This does, however, also come at the cost of rate of fire, with the number 98 firing considerably slower than the standard issue lasgun. And finally, to really hammer home the point, due to the increased power of the weapon and the fact that it uses a standard las pack, it only has 25 rounds per power pack magazine. The Lucius Pattern number 98 lasgun is a precision weapon. It's got the sheer force to put practically anything on its ass, but it requires a cool head and a steady pair of hands to get the most out of it. This is definitively not a weapon for those easily frightened. And finally, of course, every Kree Guardsman's favorite possession, their combat bayonet. A 45 centimeter long sword bayonet made out of specially treated razor sharp plasteel. The death core of Kriegs, Elan, and Bravour on the charge is well known throughout the Imperium, and along with their VAT burst technology, they are also granted the standard template construct for a special form of combat knives. This STC technology creates knives that are lighter, sharper, and easier to maintain than pretty much any other bladed weapon in the Imperium and it is more than capable of making a complete and utter mockery out of practically any form of standard issue body armor. And speaking of armor, the Death Corps doesn't get any, except for their great coach, which will provide some form of limited ballistic protection, but not much. 
It might be enough to save Death Corps Guardsmen from a hit by a ballistic or las weapon at the extreme end of its effective range, but you probably don't want to bet on it. Of course, there is also a pair of shoulder guards, but oh wow. <laughs> I suppose that if you are so lucky as to get shot only in the shoulder, then God Emperor knows, I suppose. They might save you, but their primary purpose is simply to have the regimental number along with the individual infantry number placed upon them. Basically, so that the quartermasters can have an easier time checking off the casualty lists. As for non-combat related items, the Death Corps of Kree Guardsman will carry with him two different maintenance kits, one for his number 98 LAS gun, which due to the sheer amount of heat it produces can be a somewhat temperamental weapon, and one for his respirator, which is probably hands down the most complicated piece of kit he possesses. These are both carried in a standard issue leather backpack. In addition to this, he also has a bedroll, which doubles as a waterproof half shelter, and a series of dry tin canisters. These are quite special in that they are isolated from the outside environment, which means that they can keep food and other perishable items fresh and edible even in the most hostile of climates. And of course, considering their love for siege warfare, they carry a series of entrenching tools. Usually this is a foldable spade, but in the case of heavier entrenchment works, they will be issued with pickaxes and larger shovels. As for ammunition, the standard loadout is four Lasgun power packs, along with a single frag grenade and a single crack grenade. Additionally, each member, with the exception of the sergeant and the senior guardsman, is expected to carry one form or another of ammunition for the squad's specialist gunner. This could be hydrogen flask for a plasma gun, additionally promethium for a flamer, grenades for a grenade launcher, or energy packs for a melter gun. Now, in reality, this loadout is a little bit light, since it would give the average guardsman about 125 rounds of ammunition for his las gun, which probably is nowhere even remotely close to enough for an extended engagement. And whilst most guardsmen understand rather quickly that the art of scavenging ammunition is probably the most important art a guardsman could ever learn, on Krieg, they follow the rules. And the rule says you bring four packs one frag grenade, and one crack grenade. But luckily, their officers all come from the ranks that have previously gone through the exact same shit that they are going to have to go through now. And they realize that these rules are perhaps a little bit too strict. As such, whenever a formation is expected to enter into combat, their standard issue loadout is usually bumped up quite considerably. And then the final piece of kit issued to every single Krieg Guardsman is their shoulder pads. These are used to identify which platoon, which squad, and which regiment the Guardsman is from, as well as identifying him to others as he receives his final piece of equipment, quote unquote, that being his new name. In the Death Corps, you don't go by your old name, in fact, you don't go by a proper name at all. You are simply issued a serial code and or a number. This goes true even for higher officers, and it might be reissued upon gaining a higher rank. For example, the commander of an entire regiment might simply be known as Alpha One. This is partially done as a simple expedience because, well, Death Corps regiments are used to rather high casualty figures, and as such, being able to keep the list nice and easy and tidy is very valuable, and of course, it has symbolic value. Once a man joins the Death Corps and receives his number, he is, for all intents and purposes, already dead. All that remains now is for him to commit to and complete his final sacrifice. Then his name will be crossed off a list and he can go and sit by the Emperor's side. His sacrifice and duty finally complete. And with that, as the Guardsman's life officially ends and he begins his period of sacrifice, we'll wrap up this video on the Death Corps of Krieg the starting video on the Siege of Vrax series. I hope you've enjoyed this entry, and I hope you'll stick with me for the rest of the Siege of Vrax. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.